This is the first in a series of three videos where we're going to talk about, or maybe even four videos, partial derivatives of functions of several variables. So idea is that, let's just start with a function of two variables. What we'd like to know is how is the output variable z changing as the input variables change? At what rate? That's our notion of the derivative in single variable calculus. What does derivative mean when you have two or three variables that could be changing? So this is not an easy question to answer. So we're going to break it down one step at a time. And let's first look at an example. So I've got a function of x and y, which is 4 minus x squared minus y squared. We should recognize this as a paraboloid. Its peak is there at z equals 4, and it opens downward. We'd like to find the rate of change of f as both x and y change. But that's really a complex problem. That's a, a, a difficult, involved problem. We're going to get there. Uh, but let's start by just saying, let's do it one variable at a time. Let's keep y fixed. So you say y equals the fixed number b. Then if I just write f of x comma b, b now is a constant. I just have 4 minus x squared minus b squared. The only variable in there now is x. This is just a function of a single variable x. We call that g of x, for example. And its formula would be 4 minus x squared minus b. So we could say, well, we're not finding the full derivative because we've kept one of the variables constant. But this could give us a partial derivative. It's the partial derivative of f with respect to x, and the way we define that as uh, g prime of x. So we, we keep y as a constant, or consider y to be a constant, and then just calculate the derivative with respect to x. So notice the notation here, instead of using the normal d, we have this kind of script d, and that represents the partial. So it's the partial of f with respect to x. And we could do the same thing if we wanted to find the partial derivative with respect to y. We'll keep x fixed, or we'll pretend that x is a constant, say x equals a. And then that will be just a function of y only, call it h of y. That would be 4 minus a, a squared minus y squared. And then the partial derivative of f with respect to y would be, well, the derivative of this h function, which is just minus 2y. Now, partial derivatives are used throughout mathematics, uh, science, and engineering. So there's a lot of notation depending upon the field or branch that you're looking at. But we have this partial of f with respect to x. It reminds us of dy by dx. That's the partial derivative of f with respect to x. And we show that it's a partial derivative by using that script d. But there's other ways of writing it. So we could just use a subscript. So take f with the subscript x. That's telling us that it's a partial derivative with respect to x. If the output variable is z, we could just take uh, the output variable and put a, a subscript on it too. Uh, then we have this notation, which is more common in more advanced classes and in linear algebra. We consider a, the partial derivative as a differential operator. And so we use this capital D sub x of f. And instead of x, we could actually say, well, x is our first variable. So we could just say, we're going to take the partial derivative with respect to the first input variable of f, so d sub 1 
of f. And then we could also say we're going to take the partial with respect to x of f. So this reminds us of d by dx, but this is just the partial with respect to x of f. And we may or may not put the f in brackets or parentheses when we're taking the derivative. If f has multiple terms, then it's probably better to put it in parentheses. The ones that we're going to use a lot are this original notation that looks like Leibniz notation, and we'll use the subscript notation. And then in my work, I'll use a lot of this notation where I write the partial with respect to x, so the stylized d over dx type thing to show I'm taking the derivative of a single term. So word of caution, be very, very careful. We have left the prime notation behind. Once you get to mo two or more variables, there it doesn't make sense to put a prime on anything. So if you uh, are just tied to that notation, uh, then it's time to break away. It's time to move away from that. It's really not hard to put f sub x. There's still plenty of notation which is easy to write down. And so if you put f prime on when f is a function of two or more variables, then it's totally meaningless and will be counted as wrong because it is. Uh, and then it doesn't matter if we're taking the partial with respect to f or to y. The only thing that'll change, obviously, is the an indication of which variable we're using. So we could also have an f sub y a z sub y, capital dy of f. It's the second variable, so we'd have d2, partial with respect to y of f. All of those would be valid notations. And if I had three or four or more variables, then it would just continue. I would just change the letter for the variable. So all of our rules of differentiation, so the power rule, product rule, uh, quotient rule, chain rule, sum rule, difference rule, constant multiplier rule, all the rules of differentiation hold for partial derivatives. So let's just see how we apply those rules. Um, if we want to find the partial derivative of f with respect to x, we're going to treat y as if it were a constant. So we're going to treat f as if it only depended on x. And then we'll apply the rules of differentiation to the remaining terms. So let's find the partial derivative with respect to x of the following function. It has four terms, x squared y plus x y squared plus x times e to the power of x y plus the quotient x y over y squared plus one. So just for this one example, just to really illustrate the technique, I'm going to uh, emphasize that we're treating y as a constant by replacing y with k. k we usually think of as being a constant. And then I'm going to take the partial derivative. And because of the sum rule, I can just break that down one term at a time. So let's go through it term by term. So I'm just taking the derivative now with respect to x. It says partial with respect to x, but since I'm treating the uh, other letter as a constant, then it's really the derivative with respect to x. So in the first term, I would use the power rule, and I would just get 2kx. k I'm treating as a constant multiplier. So I can use the constant multiplier rule. In the second term, k squared is a constant multiplier. And so I just have the derivative with respect to x, which is 1. 1 times k squared will give me k squared. Now the third term, I have to be careful because look, I have x by itself. That's a function of x being multiplied by e to the power of kx. That's another function of x. So I'm going to need to use the product rule 
when I take the partial derivative of this term. So it would be the partial of the first term times the second term plus the first term times the partial derivative of the second term. Just the product rule that we've learned before. And then in the third term, uh, all of these other uh, parts of the term, the k over k squared plus 1, that's all a constant. So really all I'm doing is using the constant multiplier rule, multiplying that times the derivative with respect to x, which will be 1. And so I'll just get k over k squared plus 1. So let me just work out the derivatives then, the partial derivatives in the uh, product rule that we have here. The partial of x with respect to x is just 1. So I just get e to the kx in that first term. In the second term, the partial of x, partial with respect to x of e to the kx, uh, I'm going to have to use the chain rule with this. So the derivative of the outside is going to be e to the kx. And then I'll need to take the derivative of the inside, meaning the what's inside the exponent, take the derivative of, with respect to x, of kx. And we did that, actually. Um, have we done that? We have not done that. Well, it's just the constant multiplier rule, so I'll just get another k out of that right there. So now, um, I can't leave it in this form. I, I want to uh, change every all the k's back to y. And so then I'll have the partial derivative of f with respect to x equaling this expression right here. I've just changed every, every time, every place I saw a k, I just we put a y back in. And so finding the partial derivative with respect to another variable like y is going to be the same steps. We're going to treat the other variables, in this case treat x as if it were a constant, and we'll apply the rules of differentiation to what's left over. So same function now, let's find the partial derivative with respect to y. And again, just for these initial examples, I am going to really enforce that we're treating k, I'm sorry, x, as a constant in this case. So I'm going to replace x with k. And I can use the sum rule, so I can take the partial with respect to y of each term separately. So <clears throat> in my first term, again, k squared is just a constant multiplier. The partial of y with respect to y is just 1. So for the first term, I should just get k squared. In the second term, I'll use the power rule, and I'll get 2ky. In the third term, I don't need to use the, the product rule anymore, because now this k is just a constant multiplier. It's not a function of y. Now, e to the ky is still a function of y. So I am going to have to use the chain rule, so the derivative of the outside being e to the power of ky. And then I'll have to multiply that times the derivative of what's inside the exponent, which is ky. However, in the last term, both the top and the bottom here are functions of y. So I'm going to have to use the quotient rule. So what would that be? Well, that would be the partial of the top times the bottom. Now subtract off the partial of the bottom times the top. And that'll be all over the bottom squared. So same quotient rule that we've learned and used many times before. So let's work out the remaining partials here. Partial with respect to y of ky is just going to be k. So I'm going to get a k e to the ky times k again. Inside the quotient rule, uh, I just said the partial of y 
of ky is going to be k partial of y with respect to y of y squared plus 1 will give me 2y. And uh, of course, nothing to do in the denominator. So now let's change everything back to x. I will make a some simplification here. I have a k times a k, so I'll change that to k, uh, k squared, which will become then x squared. And so now there is a question here, you know, how much should we simplify? This is a fine answer as it is. I certainly do appreciate when people recognize that I can multiply, you know, this k times k or x times x to get x squared. That's a useful simplification. Uh, what about the quotient? Well, let's just uh, take a, a stroll through memory lane back to a quick algebra uh, reminder here. If I'm trying to simplify that, what can I do? Well, I could certainly remove the parentheses, so use the distributive property in the numerator. And then I see after I do that, I have like terms. So I could go ahead and collect those like terms. And then I see that still working in the numerator that x is a common factor. So I could factor that out uh, and see if I have any common factors in the numerator and the denominator. And the answer is no. 1 minus y squared is obviously different from y squared plus 1. So if I wanted to, I could do those algebraic operations. But please pay attention here. y squared plus 1. I know that people just get tempted and it's, it's just a bad, that goes back to a bad uh, algebra teaching is that, oh, you see a y squared plus one in the top, you see a y squared plus one on the bottom, and you just start crossing things out. And th that's just simply nonsense. What can you do is you could find a form of one. In order to find a form of one, you first have to factor the numerator and the denominator completely. Well, we did that in the green here, and we found that there are no common factors. This y squared plus 1 is only in one of the terms in the numerator. It is not in any term in the, uh, the 2xy squared does not have a factor of y squared plus 1. So you cannot cancel that y squared plus 1. All right, I'd like to do some more examples, but I'm going to leave that in a second video to try to keep my videos a little bit shorter.